you hear people talk about the Manhattanization of skylines around the world, of cities around the world, what comes to mind for you? Is that a good thing, a bad thing, something that we should even be concerned about? Well, personally, I, th I think it's a good thing. I mean, it's uh, indicative of the, of the growth that's going on in New York City, which I think is all very positive. Um, major trend going on in the re-urbanization of, of cities. I think um, since the invention of, of cars, there was a big sprawl across the United States, but uh, recently, over the last couple of decades, there's been a, a big movement back into cities, and that has really spurned the, uh, you know, the next phase of development and the reurbanization. Do you think that sort of typology, that density, is appropriate for all cities, or is this something that needs to be considered carefully? Well, I'd say you certainly need to consider it carefully. Um, I think random development is probably not a good thing for a city. Uh, development needs to be responsible and hopefully additive to the overall fabric of, uh, of a city. That's interesting. Well, so what, how would you define responsible development? Well, I, th I think for um, development to be successful, it, it needs to be around a cluster. Um, there needs to be a lot of amenities um, and um, you know, a, a lot of things that basically add to the fabric of a, of a precinct. So you're basically creating a, a precinct. When you think about successful cities, pre-automobile, you know, everything was within a 20-minute walking distance. I think that's where we had, we're, we're heading again. So, you know, all those things that uh, make a precinct successful need to be thought through carefully. Hmm. What's unique about the political process of development in New York? And what's good about that? What could probably be changed? Well, look, I, I think uh, big city politics is big city politics, no matter where you are. Um, and you know, when you think about New York City and the periods of time when we were most, most productive, there was a healthy input and in incentives provided by, um, by the public sector. So, you know, think back to the 90s or so when um, Times Square was developed, there was a lot of incentives provided to clean up what was then a derelict neighborhood. Um, it became a very important a contributing part part of our city. Post 9/11, um, the city provided um, Liberty Bonds, uh, which helped rebuild Lower Manhattan. Right now, the Hudson Yards, uh, the next major area of development in New York City, in Manhattan in particular, um, there's incentives for, for development as well as rezoning. So, you know, I think those things are those are important. Um, right now, the current administration is very focused on affordable housing. I think their policies are at their infancy. Um, and, um, you know, there's some more work to be done, but I, but I think it's certainly uh, an admirable uh, cause. Are there ways, generally speaking, in which incentives could responsibly encourage affordable housing? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's all about the math, to be honest. Like, I've, I have yet to find a successful not-for-profit developer. Um, you know, they will, developers build what, what they can afford to build. So, there, you know, there has to be economic incentives to to help developers um, provide affordable housing, which is important to the diversity of a city. So a lot of people have talked about, in New York especially, wanting to build a New York building, or developers seem to always be, I don't know if under pressure is the right way to put it, but quick to say that this is very much of the character of New York, and that goes for any city they're developing in. Um, for good reason, people want to live in and support buildings that seem to be of the place that they are being built in. Um, to you, what is a New York building? Yeah, for, for us in, in Brookfield, and we're very active all around the world um, in developing, and, but for us, it's, it really starts from the inside out. It, you know, for us to undertake development of a property, it has to work for, for the ultimate end user. So you know, we make sure that the building has floor plates and ceiling heights and systems and uh, sustainability initiatives which are of the moment, uh, the best thinking at the time, but also adaptable so that they can be upgraded in the future. Um, as far as exterior design, I'd say we're, you know, we're more uh, focused on sleek and modern, uh, simple, uh, certainly not whimsical. You see whimsical buildings at parts around the world and that's, you know, we really don't think um, those kind of properties withstand the test of time. Hmm. So something timeless, I guess? Something timeless. S something timeless, but most importantly, something that works. What in your process helps you 
arrive at that sort of design? Because that's a, everyone would like a timeless building. Yeah, so for, you know, for us, we've got 100 million square feet of office buildings around the world in cities um, um, from Sydney and Melbourne to London to Sao Paulo, Rio, uh, Toronto, and on and on. Um, and we're able to draw from what's happening in each of these places. And it, what, what's very interesting is not always does the United States lead the pack. You know, we, in our Australian buildings, for example, we noticed the movement to open space planning and more community spaces and that kind of thing. Same thing was sort of happening in London. We saw very little of that a decade ago in New York City. So we're able to draw on um, these experiences all around the world to, you know, to help influence what we do here in New York. Which is appropriate, New York being such a global city to be influenced by cities from London or Rio. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, there's a lot of development even going on now in, in Brooklyn, in Queens even. And, and it's getting dense, it's getting tall. Um, the economics would suggest that it should, the, you know, the land use uh, economics especially, it's already pretty dense. Um, should the density that we earlier in this conversation referred to as Manhattanization, should that continue to other boroughs? Yeah, I th it, absolutely it should and um, f for a lot of different reasons, but w w one important reason is really affordability. You know, we're, we're building an apartment building in Manhattan um, and just because of the cost of construction and the land cost, the rents that we need to make that apartment building viable are about $90 a foot. So we're also just beginning a development on the waterfront in Brooklyn, uh, a similar sized project, and we can charge rents that are a third cheaper. So if you think you're, think, think of a young person, young professional starting out in, in the New York area, um, Brooklyn is a great place, and this particular project that we're doing in Brooklyn is on the water, uh, fantastic views, um, great amenities, great neighborhood. Um, you know, it takes a little longer maybe to get to work if you live in Manhattan, but transportation is good enough and certainly worth um, the sacrifice given that prices are a third cheaper.